there's pack hunting, but there's also sociality, which is such an interesting idea. It's how did they live? And this is something you look at that paleontology doesn't often touch is like the lives. <laughs> yeah, because, because, you know, animals are doing complicated things. So, you know, in the case of lions, a large part of this is down to territoriality and the, the males ultimately are defending the territory and that's effectively protecting the females. But of course, what they're mostly protecting them from is other males. So there's a ludicrous bit of self-interest um but that's effectively how it's operating as a system but it could just be predatory type cheetahs are my go-to example for this so cheetahs are the weird ones compared to the other cats because females are solitary but males are social so brothers will when when you know if the female has five or six cubs the brothers will stay together in a group and then the girls will go off on their own and if you're a if you're the only brother or the only survivor, you will usually hung up, hook up with a gang of other males. So cheetahs are pack hunters if you're male and a solitary hunter if you're female. So it's not about territory defense or occupation for them. It's about prey type. Is it possible to know the sex of a T-Rex or any of the other dinosaurs? Like what, what can paleontology show us? So in theory, yes. In practice, it's way more complicated. So unless you get very lucky, we have a handful of specimens that still have eggs inside them. Instant giveaway. Um, but that's like two or three. Um, what you can look for is both reptiles and birds have a thing called medullary bone. And when you're laying eggs and you need a lot of calcium very quickly, so the, the, that egg shell goes on basically like kind of like the last minute during egg development. So you need a lot of calcium very quickly. So during the laying season, these animals grow this really weird kind of bone texture on big things like the femur and the humerus, like really big bones in the body. And that's, it's got a weird texture because it's full of blood vessels and it's full of blood vessels so that you can basically apply a lot of blood supply to it quickly, suck up some of the calcium from that bone, take it through the system, put it on the eggs, lay your eggs. We can find that. So if you have a dinosaur bone and it's the right kind of thing, so you can't do it on like a finger or a claw or a bit of rib, but nice big bone, you could cut a chunk of that out, grind it down to the point that it's virtually transparent, fraction of a millimeter thick, put it under a microscope and have a look. And if you see the right bone texture, that's there. there's some exceptions, but that's very probably medullary bone and you have yourself a female. So the instant assumption is, okay, so you can tell female from male. No, we can tell laying female from everything else. So males won't have medullary bone. Young females won't have them. Females outside of the breeding season won't have it. Females inside the breeding season, but maybe they've been really sick this year, don't have it, or they laid their eggs early and now they don't need it anymore, won't have it. So occasionally, if you cut up a bone, which of course we try not to do that much, you can get the signal of medullary bone and infer that you have a female in the breeding season. But there's no like large bone structure differences. Well, maybe there is, but we haven't seen it. You look at things like um, kudu or um, blackbuck and all kinds of antelope or even most deer, and the males have horns or antlers and the females don't. And then you look at something like triceratops and all the ceratopsians, it's a big clade of oh it must be 40 species by now and every single one of them has the frill and has some kind of horn somewhere you don't have the hornless ones or the frillless ones in the way that we do with a lot of these i'm, I'm trying to figure out how, is there how many of the species is it obvious that there's uh like like pelvis differences all that so, kind of stuff? so pelvis differences works on like humans and apes and maybe a couple of other mammals but it's mostly not very good because we are, it's because we give birth to such a gigantic baby com with a gigantic head compared to our sizes that women have different pelvises to men and then there's size differences like the skull is not as it's, reliable as it's the pelvis. not and then again you just need to look at you know humans are always slightly dodgy with this because of you know our evolutionary history and cultural history but like you know there's there's population differences you know, you you there are there are maned female lions in places. There are maneless male lions in places. Um, reindeer, uh, female reindeer have antlers in winter. So Rudolph was a girl because every illustration of Santa and his reindeer ever has, they all have antlers, and that's that's a female reindeer, not a male. If it's winter, so basically we don't 
know much about the dating and the sex lives of uh, T-Rexes. Well, not much, but you can make some inferences. So, for example, um, all tyrannosaurs uh, have at least some kind of crest on the head. The early ones have like this midline crest. It, it really doesn't work on a human. They have like a midline crest running along the top of the nose that sticks up. The later ones largely don't, but they do have this weird armored structure along those fused nasals, and then they have little horns over the eyes. Those, as far as we can tell, don't really have any kind of obvious mechanical function. And loads, like outside of the feathered dinosaurs, the vast majority of dinos of carnivorous dinosaurs have some kind of crest or display feature on the head. When you say display feature, meaning for sex appeal, to attract mates. Or something like that. So I, I've always favored the term socio-sexual selection to cover both sexual display and sexual dominance and communication, um, but also social ones, because those two things are hard to tell apart. Female lions find males with darker manes sexier, but male lions find males with darker manes more intimidating. So one of them is sex, but one of them is social. Nice. Uh, then, they're, 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 I mean, I guess it goes hand in hand, sure. It, yeah. it, it can, but then you get things like the other one I go for is uh, black swans, these beautiful Australian birds. They have these really weird curly feathers on their wings. And males and females both have them. And males prefer females with curlier feathers, and females prefer males with curlier feathers as an obvious sexual link. But then females fight too. Females fight over the best nesting spots. And the females with the curliest feathers tend to win those fights. How does that make sense? This gets into classic sexual selection theory. It's, it's what's called an honest signal. You couldn't have those curly feathers if you weren't able to support them. Oh, because they're their yeah. primary feathers on the wings. And what it actually does is it makes it harder to fly. So you're basically going, look how tough I am. I've grown this big and I can fly and carry on with my giant curly feathers because I'm really tough and I'm in good shape. And it's the same with the lion. The reason you get pale lions in the south is because it's or close to the equator because it's too hot. So there's the trade-off because if you have a really black mane, yeah, all the males know you're rock and all the females know you're super sexy, but you just die of overheating. The trade-off is if the heat's going to kill you, you're probably better off being a bit paler and surviving <laughs> in order to reproduce than you are being jet black but just dying instantly as soon as it gets hot. So there's trade-offs there. Okay. Yeah. And that's probably what's happening with the theropods. The All the little crests and horns, Ceratosaurus, Dilophosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus have big crests over the eyes and all kinds of others. My, I've written about this. I think this is the trade-off. You're going for the sexiest look, mm -hmm. and the sexiest look is the biggest horns or the biggest spikes and whatever's on the head, probably also then with the brightest colors and the most display patterns. But also, this, this gives you away to your prey. If you're trying to hide or you're trying to sneak up on something, being brightly colored or having stripes or all this extra stuff on your head, you, you, you get spotted. Mm -hmm. But then that's the trade-off, is... If I'm this big and my horns are if my horns are this big and this red and yellow and I can still whoop I can still run those guys down and hunt them and kill them and eat them yeah then look how great I must be whereas that little guy he's only got weedy little crests and they're and they're really dark because he's so bad at catching stuff he doesn't have the extra energy to grow big crests and so and that's why but when you're a herbivore you don't have that pressure particularly something like, this is protoceratops, but something like triceratops and these guys, they're living in big groups. You can't hide from a predator when you're a group of 20 animals that are 10 tons each. So who cares? You just grow the biggest signal you can possibly grow, and lo and behold, they have giant frills and giant horns. Uh, what, what can you say about beauty in evolution? So something that's, uh, maybe you can educate me, but something that's not quite an honest signal, that's just pure beauty, like so, peacock feathers. So there are things which we think operate closer to that. So there are these are the two kind of classic ideas of sexual selection, and both are probably true to certain degrees in various different species. One is the honest signal, or the, it's the kind of the handicap hypothesis, because you're holding yourself back whilst proving you can still do it. I, I ran the marathon, you know, 
carrying a couple of weights, you're obviously stronger than the guy who ran the marathon without. Um, and so that's why it's an honest signal and it's why it's a handicap. But the other one is what's called the sexy sons hypothesis. And the idea is a female might just find a male attractive for no other reason than random. There is some component of her brain or whatever it may be that that just looks cool. And you can actually sort of get this as a human. Like, forget forget human beauty. You, c you can look at a bottle and go, that bottle's kind of nice and that bottle's kind of ugly. Where do you put, like, like, birds are interesting with this. Well, where do you put peacock feathers? So they're, they're probably more handicap hypothesis because the colors that go into them and the sheer size and shape. Oh, I see. Yeah, and yeah. You, these things basically can't fly. Um, they're really vulnerable to predators. Can the handicap hypothesis explain just how beautiful peacock feathers get? Because so, they go, what? They so go extreme. Pro probably not entirely. There's, there's almost certainly randomness going on in there as well. And then the eye spots, we know that eye spots are attractive, are, are probably encoded in some way. Um, but yeah, so going back to the sexy suns, the idea is females prefer something different for whatever reason. And there might actually be some reasons females prefer things that are different. Different usually means separate and outside. And that usually comes with it variation, like in, inherently. Also, oh, variation is evolutionary a turn on. Yeah, basically. Wouldn't that? Man, you're rolling the dice, though, aren't you? Yeah, well, you bro, right, so, so you, you've, you've got to remember, again, it's really easy to look at that sort of thing with a human perspective, where at maximum reproductive output, I think the, the record, there's, there's some obscure record, it's something like 66 children, which is probably apocryphal for a Russian woman who had loads of triplets and quads. But, like, humans don't have many offspring. But most animals lay dozens of eggs or hundreds of eggs or thousands of eggs at a time so actually so diversity pays off more there so diversity can pay off we we think that's probably a major part of the reason that sex evolved in the first place is it gives you resistance to changing environment and it gives you resistance to parasites and diseases which often reproduce way faster than you do mm. you know bacteria can divide in a few hours we reproduce every 20 years that's quite a difference if we were all asexual clones and you're vulnerable to some disease you're probably going to get wiped out look at the you know irish potato famine or something like that um so different may be appealing simply because it is different it's giving you variation um and there's at least some evidence for that there's um sword tails so anyone who keeps little fish uh, if anyone sees a tropical fish uh, keeper, uh, sword tails are really quite common little tropical fish that you can get in all kinds of aquarium shops. And they're a very boring fish shape, but the lower lobe of their tail has a big spike on it. And that's the name. And they're really close relatives of a group called the mollies, which basically don't have that. And in the wild, these are Amazonian fish. They don't usually encounter each other. But even if you go and get not even the domesticated form, because these things have been bred for you know decades at this point, you can go and get some wild mollies and give them a wild male sword tail, and they think he is so much better than all the male mollies. They will go for that one, and they will preferentially mate with that one. We don't know the exact mechanism, but it appears to be it looks similar enough that I recognize it as a potential mate, but different enough that this is exciting. Mm -hmm. And then this is where the sexy sons kick in because the females are now assuming those animals are successful and they can hybridize, or maybe it's just a male who just happens to be a little bit blue or a little bit red or whatever it may be. Um, well, the female offspring, the daughters, are probably going to inherit mother's preference. I really like red. And the males are probably going to have red in them because their dad had more red. Mm -hmm. So guess what the next generation does? It's more red, and the females like more red. Yeah. And you don't have to come back much further, and suddenly all the males are bright red. And that's closer to beauty than I think almost anything else would be with still a naturalistic explanation. We kind of started talking about beauty from how much uh, social life... Yeah, a T-Rex might have. <laughs> a T-Rex might have. So uh, uh, just to kind of take that to a place of w what we know and what we don't know, so can we kind of know something about their uh, their social life, where they lived, how they lived? So the very fact that they have these apparently socio-sexually selected signals, the, the little crest and stuff in the head, 
so there's a branch of sexual selection called mutual sexual selection, and the the black swans are an example of this. The, the classic sexual selection is, yeah, your peacocks and your lions and things like this. Males are bigger and more flamboyant and whatever it is, and they're doing all the competing. But you get mutual sexual selection, and this is really common in a whole bunch of things that people are familiar with but don't know. Loads of seabirds. Um, starlings, the common starling that we have in Europe and has been introduced into the US. Parrots, various other things, where basically males and females invest similarly in rearing the offspring. And so the idea generally, both with handicap and sexy son, but particularly with handicap, is the idea is the males are proving their worth. They're basically saying, I'm the biggest, strongest, healthiest, I've got the best genes, I should be the father of your offspring. They go around showing off and then mate with as many females as possible, while the females then do all the work and make the nest and look after the chicks and yeah, or rear them or give birth or whatever it may be, yada, yada, yada. And so the idea with mutual sexual selection is, well, what if there's not much food around? Things like puffins, uh, you know, penguins in the Arctic, you know, where the male sits with the egg and the female toddles off, gets food, and then comes back two months later or whatever it is. Um, on their own, they can't rear the offspring. They have to have a male investment. Well, now, suddenly the male's now putting loads of effort in. So the male's now in the same position that a female would be in under the normal conditions. You don't want to be the sexiest, toughest, biggest male, and you can only mate once. All right, there's, there's various cheats, but we won't get into that just yet. You're only going to mate once, and you're going to put all your effort into helping rearing offspring rather than chasing down as many girls as possible. Are you going to go for the biggest, fittest female as well, or are you going to go for the small, weedy one that doesn't look very well? You go for the best one. Well, how do you know that? Well, because she's got a crest as well. And so suddenly, you now get mutual ornamentation, just like the black swans, where the males are checking out the curliest females, and the females are checking out the curliest males. And you'll see they mutually pair up. This is what we see with things like starlings. Males like the brightest females, females like the brightest males. They tend to form pairs. The darkest and least bright ones are obviously kind of left with each other at the bottom of the pile. They tend to pair up. But it means that when you get signals in both males and females, like every Triceratops or every Tyrannosaurus, it at least hints that they're going down this route and that they might cooperate for reproduction. Wow. Another like weak signal that tells a part yeah, of the story. Yeah, and the problem is it's compromised by lots of things. So that goes back to your earlier question about telling males from females apart. The vast majority of dinosaur species, like 90 plus percent, are known from a single specimen. And a specimen is not necessarily very complete at all. It might be a couple of bones. It might be one bone. It might be a tooth in a couple of cases. The actual number where we've got a decent number of real whole skeletons that we can actually compare to each other less than 10 probably more like five or six 